We know less about the food we eat today than at any other time in history. And you know why? Because we hear more about food today than ever before. You think about the constant barrage of advertisements and commercials on radio and television, millions of posts every single day on social media. We're faced with more food brands and food products and food choices than ever before. There's an organic, a regular, a diet, a local, a non-GMO, all natural option for just about any food out there. And there are scientific studies that say things like wine and coffee cause cancer. And there are studies out there that say wine and coffee prevent cancer. Eat your vegetables, but only if they're organic because of the pesticides. Well, wait a minute, those have pesticides too. Dairy is ruining the planet. Milk does the body good. Sugar is good and fat is bad. Wait a minute, scratch that. Fat is good and sugar is bad. Extra virgin olive oil? Is it real or is it fake? Are we supposed to eat grass-fed or lab-grown meat now? Or no meat at all? Local is the future of food. But wait a minute, maybe it's pizza by drone is the future of food. Or maybe the future of food isn't food at all, it's meal replacements that we drink every few hours. And then my favorite headline of all is this one right here. Our modern food system works as designed. And that's becoming a problem. At its core, maximum calories with maximum efficiency to the most people possible, that's a good thing. But surrounding it all now is the most competitive, largest market opportunity that exists on this planet. And it's become a shouting match. It's my product versus your product, and your product versus her product. It's my way versus your way, and your way versus his way. This shouting match and all this chaos has become the language of the food system. But the problem is, food already had a language, and it was food itself. Since the beginning of time, nature created a pretty simple system for us to follow. Fruit would tell us when it was ripe or in season. We figured out which plants were edible and which ones were not. We could follow the migration patterns of animals based on weather and plant cycles. And food would communicate, food would communicate to us with uh, scents and tastes and nutrients that we could choose from. This system was by far not perfect, but it worked for millions of years. And then, just a few decades ago, humans like we do said, hold on, we got this. And we started speaking on behalf of food. It was the language of these labels and these brands and these studies and promotions and advertisements. And this is what I call the perception of food. The perception of food, or what we're paying for, says that this new food system will grow it, process it, package it, ship it, store it, and sell it to us no matter where we're at and no matter what we desire. So do you want apples and strawberries all year long? No problem. What about 99 cent gas station sushi? It's everywhere. How about three cups of coffee a day, even when there's a shortage of beans? We got you covered. And the whole time this has been going on, the language of food still exists. Sometimes it's buried and it's hard to find or hard to recognize, but it's there. And I call this the reality of food. So the perception of food says, hey, I can eat an apple all year long, and that apple will be the same, whether it's January or June or October. The reality of food says, you know what? After several weeks, or even a few days for certain foods, the nutrients that we think we're getting and paying for just don't exist. 99 cent sushi, come on. Even $35 sushi. We think there's this endless supply of fish that will support our cravings, and it doesn't exist. The reality is two thirds, or even in some cases more than that, um, of the fish that we're buying is different than what's on the menu or on the label. Coffee, coffee's a great example. So recently we've had a shortage of fresh coffee beans. And so there's been a problem in the market. Hey, as coffee drinkers, guess what? Guess who didn't feel that shortage? Us. You know why? Because somehow they magically found beans that have been stored for years, in some cases nine years, and they continue making coffee without missing a beat. 
Now, does our $5 Americano have nine-year-old beans in it? Probably not. But what about the canister at the supermarket or maybe the coffee pot at work? I bet it does. And the thing is, is that the label didn't change. I'm not here to bash big food. I'm not here to bash big government. As consumers, we are equally and fully responsible for this mess just as much as anyone is. Here's my point. Food is trying to tell us something. And we're not listening or we can't hear it because of all the noise and all the chaos that's happening within this food system. We are making changes to our food today that we don't understand. And these changes are having unintentional but catastrophic consequences to all of humanity. Today we are sicker, we are fatter, we are more malnourished than we ever have been. We waste 40% of the food that we produce. Food fraud is rampant. Trust in food and food suppliers is at an all-time low, and food production is one of the leading causes of environmental devastation. Now, I'm not here today to say, let's go back to a food system built for another era. I don't think that's the answer. And I'm not here today to say, let's blow up the current system. I actually think the answer probably resides somewhere in between the two. So I have an idea that I want to share with you that's been gaining some momentum over the last couple of months. For the past several years, there's been a group of us that have been working alongside some of the biggest food and technology companies in the world, along with a couple of the top, top academic institutions as well. And the goal of this work has been to create a series of devices that would tell us exactly what's in our food. And we have been successful in building and testing these devices in the real world. But in doing so, we uncovered something very troubling. We found that we were actually contributing to and even compounding the problem that we actually set out to solve. We were adding to the noise. And I'll tell you why. Because as we were developing this, these devices or these platforms, along with hundreds of other companies trying to do the same thing, we were developing another language and a unique set of standards. And that's a problem because these devices and these platforms didn't easily communicate with the existing technologies that run our food system today, nor did these technologies communicate with each other very well. So think about that for a minute from a consumer standpoint. Hundreds of devices out there, and if, if I have one need, a single need, maybe I have a gluten allergy, and maybe one device will actually satisfy that. But if I'm someone who wants to know if there's gluten, or I want to verify if my milk is real, or my fish is real, or I want to know the nutritional content of food, or I want to know any range of things, I could be walking into a store, or sitting down in a restaurant, with a purse full of devices and applications. It's not practical. So we thought, well, what if there was another way? What if we could translate the existing language of food in a way that can communicate across all these existing technologies and future technologies in a way that we could all fully and equally understand our food together? So the last couple of months, we tried something that we've been working on for a while. Apple season just wrapped up in the US. And so we've been traveling around the country, visiting apple orchards everywhere, and picking the top varieties of apples and sending these samples back to our lab here in Boston within 24 hours. And when the apples get back to the lab, we've been creating what we call a digital food fingerprint. These fingerprints are built solely off of the information we get from the apple. Not a label, not literature, just the apple. And you think about these fingerprints in the sense that they are essentially these comprehensive profiles, if you will, of a particular type of food. Now, each food type and each food, individual food, has a unique uh, it's a set of unique characteristics. So a Macintosh apple that comes from Riverview Farm in New Hampshire has its own fingerprint or profile. And when you combine that apple or that fingerprint with other Macintosh apples, you start to create the profile for that variety of apples. And when you combine that 
with red delicious apples from Washington or Fuji apples from New York, well then you start to develop the unique and the common or shared chemistry of apples in general. And then eventually fruit and so on and so on. So once we've established these fingerprints at a very, very high resolution in the lab, we then went out and we purchased the same varieties of apples at retail stores and online retailers. Um, and we brought them in and we scanned these with an off-the-shelf device, a simple scanner that you can get anywhere. And we collected just a few data points with this scanner. And we were able to compare that information with this high-resolution lab fidelity fingerprint that we had just created. And what we discovered is what we hoped we, we would see, that the apples were talking to us. The apples, we could see a very um, distinct and a unique uh, characteristic within the apples uh, that we bought at the store versus what we had picked uh, fresh uh, in the orchards. So we could see things like um, unique uh, freshness characteristics in terms of quality uh, and nutrition based on where the apple was from, the climate in which it grew, um, down to the individual farm, uh, how it was shipped, how it was stored, how old this apple was, difference in retailer apples from retailer A to retailer B, difference in conventional and organic apples. So this was exciting for us because it was something that we hoped we could do, but we weren't really sure. So we were highly encouraged by this information because now a single piece of food, in this case an apple, could tell us exactly what's happening to it in the life cycle of this item simply by comparing how something starts its journey through the food system and how it looks at any particular moment within that food system. Equally exciting was the fact that we could take this information that the apple was giving us and we could translate it in a way that would integrate with an existing technology and give an, an answer in a matter of just a few seconds and with the user having no special skills. So think about food as its own label. No BS, in a real-time situation, something could tell you what it is, where it's from, whether or not it's fresh, and what the nutritional value of it is. So now think about that in combination with something like the blockchain. If you knew exactly how something started its life, then blockchain all of a sudden makes sense with food. Because now, if I know how it starts, I can track it throughout every transaction until it gets to a consumer. And then once it gets there, not only can I confirm of all the different steps it's gone through, but I also can confirm that it's actually worth going through all that, that there is some nutrition left and there's some value left in that food. So think about combating food fraud when it comes to wine or milk or fish or meat or olive oil. Or what about combining it with environmental sensors in the supply chain? If I know how a food starts and I can see it degrading over time, I can go specifically into a point in the supply chain and say, I have a problem here. It's degrading faster than it should, and I can solve that problem. And that could go a long ways towards reducing waste or getting fresher food to people faster. And then finally, what about incorporating this type of information into these handheld devices and or our smartphone? Imagine never having to buy or eat food again that isn't real or isn't good for us. But more importantly, if you could do that using a common language, you can share that information with everyone and they would understand it. Whatever technology they were using, whatever language they actually spoke, they would know, hey, this is good for me or this is bad for me. So it's early days. Uh, we're highly encouraged by this work. It's exciting. Uh, we've seen enough and proved enough that we are moving on very rapidly to creating these fingerprints for the top fruits and vegetables, as well as the foods that are most adulterated and fraudulent in the world. Um, so look, as humans, we cannot separate our fate from our food system. And we'll either continue to head down this path of perception pretending like it's working and literally feeding ourselves to death. Or we'll choose to listen to our food again and we'll get real about what it can and cannot do for us. 
But food is too important to leave up to the experts. We're all in this together. We all created this mess, and we all have a responsibility to clean it up. So I'll leave you with a challenge. And that challenge is the next time you sit down for a meal, ask your food these questions. What is it? Is it real? And how is this decision impacting my body, my community, and the planet? And only when there are answers to these questions will you know if we made the right choice. Thank you.